G'day folks, welcome to the channel that helps you to tell the difference between truth and error. In this video, I want to talk about the doctrine of soul sleep as it's taught in the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Seventh-day Adventist churches. Now, if you don't know what the doctrine of soul sleep is, it's the belief that when you die, you don't go to heaven, you don't go to hell, you simply cease to exist until judgment day. You basically sleep in the dust of the earth until judgment day when uh, Christ raises up everyone and judges everyone according to their works. And I want to look at all of the Bible verses that people use to try to defend the teaching of soul sleep. And I want to show you that none of the verses that they use actually support the doctrine. The first passage I want to look at is Ecclesiastes chapter 9, beginning at verse 5, and it says this, For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love, their hatred, and their envy have now perished. Never more will they have a share in anything done under the sun. Now Jehovah's Witnesses and Seventh-day Adventists will take this passage and they'll say, look, it says here, the dead know nothing. If the dead were in heaven or in Hades, they would at least know something, right? But here the passage says the dead know nothing. That means soul sleep, according to them, must be true. How do we respond to this? Well, first of all, I think we need to understand what the book of Ecclesiastes is all about. The book of Ecclesiastes, the traditional view of the book, is that it represents Solomon's search for the purpose and meaning of life when he was living in apostasy and idolatry. And he's looking at the world and he's saying, look, meaningless, meaningless. Everything is meaningless, right? Now, is that true? Do you believe that the, I mean, that's how the book begins. Do you believe that everything is meaningless? He says, look, I've looked at everything under the sun. It's all meaningless. He says, you know, even the search for wisdom is, is meaningless. He says, you know, the same fate overtakes the righteous and the unrighteous. He says, there's no difference between the fate of man and the fate of animals. He says this in the book. In fact, if you were to just sit down with a highlighter and highlight all the things that Solomon says in this book that contradict the teachings of Scripture elsewhere, you'd be surprised the amount of things that actually comes up. And so I, I think this reflects Solomon's you know, view of the world as he's living in sin and apostasy. And some people say that it also reflects his journey back to God. And so you see his thoughts and his heart drifting back to God from time to time throughout the book. Now, the other thing that's worth noting here is it says in the very verse that they quote, they have no more reward. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you think if you're a Seventh-day Adventist or a Jehovah's Witness or you believe in soul sleep and you use this verse, do you think that the righteous dead have, an, uh, have a reward awaiting them? I think you'd have to say yes, right? The, the righteous ha still have an, a, a reward awaiting them. But here it says they have no more reward, right? You see, there's something not quite right here about what Solomon is saying. It also says here, the, for the memory of them is forgotten. I mean, the memory of Solomon is not forgotten, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't even have this book, right? <laughs> Yet, um, you know, it says here, the memory of them is forgotten. And God certainly doesn't forget them. We don't forget them. So something is not quite right here about what Solomon is saying. Also notice in verse 6, it says, Never more will they have a share in anything done under the sun. So, you know, Solomon is almost looking and saying, look, these, these people, they're not going to have anything to do with anything on earth ever again, ever again. That's Solomon's view of the world at this particular point that he's writing. And I'm sure, you know, he went back and forth and, you know, maybe even uh, contradicted himself from time to time. But here in this verse, he says here, never more will they have a share in anything done under the sun. You might say, well, you know, maybe he was saying like, you know, when there's a new heavens and a new earth, there'll be a new sun or something like that. The new heavens and the new earth come after the thousand year reign. The resurrection takes place before the thousand year reign. So even that is inconsistent with what um, Solomon is saying here in this passage. I think the best way to understand the book is to say that Solomon is, you know, expressing his thoughts and opinions as he was searching for the purpose and meaning of life while he was living in apostasy and sin, and perhaps it also reflects his journey 
uh, back to God, you know, throughout the book um, as he, you know, basically looks at the world. And it says it again and again, you know, it uses the term under the sun, under the sun, under the sun. And he talks about, you know, I set my mind. I started thinking about this. He started, this is how the book kind of goes, you know, so it flows in this way. It doesn't represent, you know, a um, divine theological, you know, revelation about the afterlife, right? That's just not what this passage is giving us. The next passage I want to look at is Psalm 146. Psalm 146. Uh, this is another very popular passage of Scripture, although you see pretty quickly it's, it's not a good one, uh, that they try to use to say that, um, you know, when, um, when humans die, when, when people die, um, they just you know, cease to exist. They, they don't think anymore. It says this in verses 3 and 4, Do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man, in whom there is no help. His spirit departs, he returns to his earth. In that very day, his plans perish. Now, the King James says his thoughts perish. And the Hebrew word, uh, it is the word thoughts. When you look at the lexicon, it's not plan. But the word translated as thoughts, or here it's translated as plans in the New King James, and most other translations translate it as plans. The word is used only one time in the entire Old Testament, and it's right here. So I don't think we can be too dogmatic about what this particular word means. And most translations, as I've, as I've said, say that it, it's plans, not thoughts. And so, and that really fits the context. And, you know, plans are, of course, thoughts. And so it seems in the context, he's saying, don't trust in, in man, whether he's a prince or whoever he is, don't trust in him, because when he dies, his plans perish, right? But God's plans continue on forever. God's plan will always come to pass. That seems to be what this passage is saying. The next one is Psalm 115. And here it starts to get a little bit more tricky. Psalm 115 uh, verses uh, 16 to 17, it says this, uh, sorry, 16 to 18, it says this, the heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the children of men. The dead do not praise the Lord, nor any who go down into silence. But we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Praise the Lord. And Jehovah's Witnesses and Seventh-day Adventists will take this passage and they'll say, look, it says here in verse 17, the dead do not praise the Lord. If there were people in heaven right now, surely they would be praising the Lord. But this passage says the dead do not praise the Lord. Therefore, there's nobody in heaven right now. Everybody's sleeping in the dust of the earth, just as they've been telling us all along. How do we respond to this? First of all, I think it's important to understand the context here of this psalm. I remember somebody commented the other day after watching a few of my videos, and he says, I've come to learn that context really changes the meaning of the passage. And I think that's exactly the point that I try to convey in my videos. When you look at the context, everything changes, right? First of all, when you look at the beginning of the chapter, you see that the psalmist is wanting to give glory to God on the earth, in the sight of the Gentiles. Very important to understand this. Let me read this to you, verses 1 and 2. It says, Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but to your name give glory. Because of your mercy, because of your truth, why should the Gentiles say, So where is their God? But our God is in heaven. He does whatever He pleases. Their idols are silver and gold. And the psalmist goes on to talk about how God delivers his people and blesses his people. And as a result, the psalmist begins to bless the Lord. And really what this is saying is that the Gentiles can see their God by the deliverance that he brings and the blessing that he gives. That's really what the psalmist is saying. Now, if the opposite was true, if God wasn't to bless them, if God wasn't to deliver them and they were to perish, then who would praise the Lord in the sight of the Gentiles? No one. The dead can't praise you. That's the point that the psalmist is trying to make. He's not really speaking about the afterlife. He's not speaking about the afterlife at all. He's speaking about the dead being unable to praise God in the sight of the Gentiles if God wasn't to come through and deliver them from their enemies and to bless them. That's really what the psalmist is saying. He's not talking about the afterlife per se, he's talking about the dead being unable to praise God in the midst of the Gentile nations. That's the context in which this uh, is being spoken. Now, the next one is Psalm chapter 30, and I think this is very similar. Psalm chapter 30, what profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it declare your truth? 
Hear, O Lord, and have mercy on me. Lord, be my helper. Now, as I said before, this psalm is very similar to the previous one, except uh, in the previous one, it was, you know, the people of God praising God in the midst of the Gentile nations. But here it's David praising God in the midst of Israel rather than his enemies rejoicing over him. If you look in verse one, let me read this to you. Verse one of the same chapter it says this, I will extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. You see, every time God gave David victory, David always responded by extolling the Lord and praising God for all of his victories that he gave him. And so every time David was victorious, God's name was glorified and praised. And all of Israel knew about the greatness of God because God was with David. But if the opposite was true and David's enemies were to defeat him and God was uh, uh, to allow David to be killed, then, you know, God's uh, enemies and David's enemies would be rejoicing over David rather than the other way around. And so when David says, will the dust praise you? He's appealing to God because he knows that God uh, wants his name to be great. God wants his name to be praised and glorified. God uh, wants people to look at David and see that the God of David is great and awesome. And so David appeals and says in verse 9, What profit is there in my blood? What, what profit is there to you in my death, God? When I go down to the pit, will the dust praise you? And the answer, of course, is, is no. God, if David's body was to rot in the ground, his body would not praise God in the earth anymore. That's the point that David is making here. He's not speaking about the afterlife. He's speaking here about God's name being praised uh, in the land of Israel, even in the ears of the wicked. That's the point that's being made here in this chapter. Great psalm. There's some messianic undertones there as well. Really good psalm. Uh, well worth reading. Now, the next um, passage I want to look at is Job chapter 14. Job chapter 14. And, you know, with the story of Job, we know that Job lost everything. You know, he lost his uh, children. They were all killed. Uh, he lost all of his possessions. Uh, his wife was telling him to curse God and die. He was struck with sickness and a skin disease. And he was basically sitting there scraping off uh, boils with like a piece of pottery or something. And he was in a place of, you know, misery, really. He was in misery, perhaps even depression. And in that context, he says this, he says, but man dies and is laid away. Indeed, he breathes his last. And where is he? As water disappears from the sea and a river becomes parched and dries up, so man lies down and does not rise. Till the heavens are no more, they will not awake nor be roused from their sleep. And so Seventh-day Adventists and Jehovah's Witnesses take this passage and they say, look, it says here, so man lies down and does not rise till the heavens are no more. They will not awake nor be roused from their sleep. And they say, look, you know, that's it. They're just laying in the dust until the heavens are no more. A couple of things here that we need to realize. Not everything that Job said was correct, right? Not everything Job said was correct. I mean, Job earlier on, he was blaming God. I mean, if you just look a little bit earlier, he said some things about God that, that, is, that are not true. He said this, he said in chapter 9, verse 21 to 24, I am blameless, yet I do not know myself. I despise my life. It is all one thing. Therefore, I say he, referring to God, destroys the blameless and the wicked. If the scourge slays suddenly, he laughs at the plight of the innocent. The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. He, referring to God, covers the faces of its judges. If it is not he, who else could it be? You see, Job begins to blame God for his suffering and he begins to say that God is unjust. God, you know, destroys, he laughs at the plight of, of the innocent and he blinds, deliberately blinds the eyes of the judges. He, he speaks untruthfully at times about God. And Job even recognizes this himself later on. He recognizes this at the end in chapter 42, verse 3, halfway through the verse, he says, Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. And then in verse 6, therefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. You see, Job himself admits that he didn't always speak what was correct. He admits that he spoke incorrectly. He spoke things that were beyond him, things he did not know. And he abhorred himself for saying them and he repented in dust and ashes. 
And I think that's what's going on here. He's speaking from a place of deep depression, a place of deep suffering. And what's interesting is that he says here, so man lies down and does not rise till the heavens are no more. They will not awake nor be roused from their sleep. Now, this is a, a statement that is inconsistent with the teachings of the JWs and the Seventh-day Adventists as well. Why do I say that? Because it says they will not rise till the heavens are no more. Now, when is that? Well, I think from Job's perspective, that's never going to happen, right? So the, he's basically saying that they will never rise. Again, they will never be aroused from their sleep. That's what Job is saying. Now, you might say, well, you know, the new heavens and the new earth and stuff like that. Okay, but again, that's after the thousand year reign, whereas the resurrection of the righteous takes place before the thousand year reign. So again, we have another inconsistency. I think the best way to understand the words of Job here is to say that Job was speaking very pessimistically. He probably knew that what he was saying wasn't even true. He was speaking from a place of depression. And really, he was saying something out of pain. He was saying, look, you know, people, they lay down, they die, and that's it. That's the end of them. You know, they suffer in life. He goes on to say that he wished he'd never been born. He wishes the day of his birth would be blotted out. He wishes he, he had never existed in the first place. That's what Job goes on to say. I think the best way to understand Job is that he's speaking from a place of pain. And, you know, when you're in pain, you say things you don't necessarily mean. I mean, you know, sometimes people, they say things they know are not true when they're suffering. For example, they might say, you know, God doesn't care about me. God doesn't care about me. And they say this out of pain. They know it's not true. They know God cares, but they're speaking this out of pain. That's how I would understand the words of Job here in this passage. I think these verses that I've read to you are really the strongest arguments, the strongest verses that uh, JWs and Seventh-day Adventists use to try to support soul sleep. And I don't think any of them really support it at all. There is another passage. Um, there's a few, obviously there's more. I mean, I could sit here all day covering them, right? But what I want to do maybe instead is just look at some of the positive arguments, the, the arguments against the the doctrine of soul sleep you know a typical example would be uh, the story of saul and the medium where saul goes to the medium asks her to communicate with samuel and samuel comes up and speaks and it's interesting because um, Saul can't see Samuel when, re when you read that story, but the medium does. And she describes him coming up from the earth and his mantle and so forth. And he bows down and starts talking, but uh, Saul can't see um, Samuel, but the medium can. So th there is an existence there of a person, Samuel, independent of the body. Uh, another example is when, I think it's Elisha, uh, when he um, laid on a, a widow's son died and she asked you know elijah elisha to come and pray for him and she was very upset and so forth elisha uh, spread out his body upon his body and prayed to god that his soul would come back into his body very interesting isn't it and the bible actually goes on to say that god heard his prayer and his soul came back into his body very very fascinating passage of scripture another one uh is you know you'd, you'd look at um, moses and elijah obviously elijah was taken up in a whirlwind a chariot of fire to heaven uh, but moses died and was buried yet moses is speaking to jesus on the uh, mount of transfiguration another very interesting passage you look at the book of revelation you see the souls under the altar uh, that was slain because of the word of God and the testimony and they speak to God and say how long until you avenge our blood so you've got souls in heaven there in addition to that you've got you know the 24 elders in heaven you know they're, they're also human beings most scholars you know look at the 24 elders as though they're human beings uh, there are you know piles and piles of passages I mean we could sit here all day um, I think one of the keys if we go to um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 I think one of the keys to see this issue, because there are obviously verses in the Bible that speak about, uh, you know, the us, you know, um, being asleep, you know, people that are dead are asleep. And I think one of the best verses, I think, that really kind of uh, fits the whole thing together is um, 1 Thessalonians, sorry, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. <clears throat> Uh, say beginning at verse 13 it's a bit of a long passage but you'll see it all kind of come together here it says this but i do not want you to be ignorant brethren concerning those who have fallen asleep lest you sorrow as others who have no hope for if we believe that jesus died and rose again even so god will bring with him those who sleep in jesus i want you to notice that god will bring with him those who sleep in jesus so when jesus christ returns he will bring with him 
those that have fallen asleep. Okay, so, so very interesting, right? Let's keep reading. Verse 15, For this we say to you by the word of God, word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. Seems to me that when Jesus Christ returns, he brings with him the souls of those who are asleep in Christ, and he raises their bodies up at the same time. That's the way that I would understand this. Um, another really good passage is in Philippians. Philippians, and this is a really um, quite a popular one. It's, it's very hard to dispute this passage in Philippians. Um, Philippians chapter 1, verse 22 to 24, and it says this, But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit for my labor. Yet what shall I choose? I cannot tell. For I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. So he expresses this desire to depart and be with Christ, but at the same time, he also has the desire to stay in the flesh and help people. There's another verse in the Bible that says that um, uh, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Another really good passage is the book of Acts. And um, this is when Stephen is being stoned. And I want to um, join two passages of Scripture together uh, to counter the objection that um, Seventh-day Adventists and Jehovah's Witnesses use to evangelical Christians using this particular verse. But this is in Acts chapter 7, verse 59. It says this, And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. A couple of things worth pointing out here. First of all, he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. So that implies the deity of Christ. But also, notice he says he receive my spirit. Now, those who believe in soul sleep will say, yeah, um, what happens is that, you know, what happened when God created man, formed him out of the dust of the earth, he breathed the breath of life in him, he became a living soul. But when he dies, the body uh, just goes back into dust and the spirit returns to God from where it came. But here, I want to show you something in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5. This is really fascinating to kind of refute that interpretation. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5. It says this, and this is in the context of church discipline. It says this, Deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Notice there, he says, you know, deliver this person over to Satan. Let him be kicked out of the church for the destruction of his flesh. Deliver him over to Satan to be judged, etc. For the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved on the day of judgment. You see, it's possible for his spirit to be lost. It's possible for his spirit to be damned. You see, that's what's going on here. So I think we need to understand when he's, he didn't, when, when um, Stephen spoke to God and said, receive my spirit, he didn't say, receive your spirit. He said, receive my spirit. And that's what's happening here. It's his spirit that he's saved on the day of judgment. Now, as I said, we could sit here all day going through verse after verse after verse that proves uh, that soul sleep is unbiblical. But I think what I've given you is enough. I also think that people will probably give extras in the comments section. And um, I always like to read the comments. I don't always respond because it would just take too long if I get 100 comments and I spend, say, a minute or 30 seconds responding to all of just 100 comments and I get thousands of comments. You know, it would take me a very long time to respond to them all. But I do read them. I heart them. I respond to some of them. Um, I often learn from your comments, actually, as well. So where I'm wrong about something, sometimes I'll, I'll look at the comments and I think, great, you know, that was a good argument, you know, refuting my point in that particular verse or something like that. So please leave comments. I do read them. Um, and uh, I don't delete them unless someone's insulting me, basically. Um, so, yeah, I uh, hope you like this video. If you have, please consider subscribing. Give me a thumbs up. Hit the bell notification button. I'll see you in the comments section, and you'll see me in my next video.